wait until the end. Who's not a member of the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Science? We don't have this many people in our college. Holy smokes. <laughs> you guys heard this free beers later today or something. You're sneaking in here. So thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, we have just a little bit of fun, a little bit of information, a little bit of social gathering. Uh, when we put this slide together just about three weeks ago, the spring time was here, the flowers were blooming. Uh, we called it the spring forum, but the truth is, it's probably much more of a you know uh, winter wonderland uh, in the last couple of days and the last week or so than it is the spring forum. But certainly, what I'm learning um, is that you know we don't really call it spring until. I guess it's July, I don't know when it's spring, but my kids have quickly learned that hurricane days in Florida and snow days in Florida and in Colorado can uh, both have the same advantages, but what you do outside is a lot is a lot different. So they enjoyed a little snow time um, last week. Quick look at agenda. Our hope really over the next half hour is to make sure that you feel informed about all the things that are happening within the college. Uh, that we do it in an informal, um, fun way, and that we also use the fact that we've got all of you together in one place to make sure that you guys have some social time and some time to build relationships throughout the college about what's going on. Uh, so with that being said, our formal code says that part of our spring forum is committee reports. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize and thank all of you that serve on committees, obviously critical to the success of our college. A special thanks to those that are um, being chairs of these committees, huge amount of work that goes into that. We are not going to read all those uh, piles of reports. I know you were looking forward to that. But what we are want to make sure is that you know who the chairs are. If you have any questions, please reach out to them. At the same time, all of these reports are online and easily accessible. So please, if you have an interest in more information, uh, go to this site and learn about all the great work that our committees are doing. We've hired lots of folks over the last six months or so, uh, but I wanted to call out four individuals that are in the Dean's office that I want to make sure that you guys are aware of. So the first is Chris. Um, Chris may be still manning the shirt boots out front, but she uh, deserves a big thanks for uh, helping pull off today. Many of you know Chris, uh, she worked for many years with OEO and is now uh, my assistant in the Dean's office, and it's great having her there. Janice is still with us. Uh, we're able to keep her one to two days a week uh, kind of into the hopefully uh, long-term future. Uh, but Chris has moved over full-time with us. Pam Jones, you may have seen an announcement that just happened over the last week. Is Pam, is Pam speaking? Welcome, thanks for joining us. So Pam survived the interview process. We were able to steal her away from Boulder, that other place uh, down the road. Um, she is a CSU alum and she also worked at CSU before and it's gonna be great to have her working full-time with us uh, as the executive director of development. So welcome aboard, Pam. Officially starts the 20th, but we're trying to sneak her in as much as we can uh, before that 20th of May. Many of you have worked with Bob um, and know that he has been with us for several months. Uh, we are pulling him into a full-time uh, uh, facilities management position. As you guys know better than anybody, whether it be our aging facilities or the new facilities that we want to build on property, that we have this kind of tied up strategically, that we can present this to uh, Central, and that we can make sure that all of our labs, all of our teaching space, all of our office areas um, are as best as they can be. So, um, so he's really going to be in charge of all of those efforts moving forward for the college. And then just as of today, um, you will start seeing announcements uh, for Coleman. Coleman <laughs> welcome, our newest member of the college. So Coleman, we've been able to acquire uh, more of the college of the sciences. We've been with the with CSU for many years, and she's going to lead up our communications team here. So, um, Brandy, welcome. I don't know if we've got an official start date, but sometime in May you'll start seeing her uh, with us full time. Quick look at finance for the college. I'm not going to show a lot of graphs. This may be one of the only ones you see, but I do want to give you a high-level look at all the things that are happening from a revenue perspective. So $110 million from our college coming in, pretty typical over the last couple of years in that range. The only real difference you may note, uh, we've seen a small amount of decrease percentage-wise uh, in the research dollars and a nice increase in some of our revenue generating areas in the veterinary diagnostic lab and the VTH. Additionally, PBM um, tuition dollars have gone up a little bit along with some of our state appropriations. Most of this is probably startup dollars 
um, for my package. So, so this is very solid. Um, um, this is very solid in some of the work that um, you guys are all aware of. Uh, some of this you saw last fall during our fall forum, the material on the left, how we implemented about a half a million dollars of uh, incremental dollars to new positions and to new efforts within the different departments. And then on the right, some of this may be new to some of you, we just decided as an executive council just about a month or two ago how we will use the new dollars that are available come July 1 um, of my startup package for some uh, so new positions and new initiatives uh, that are coming out there. This is um, about $2 million that the provost has uh, recommended to the president, to the board of governors, as incremental budget dollars for next year that will come back to our college. Many of these things um, you may be aware of already. Uh, some of our Plan B master's programs, some of the differential tuition are all things that um, have been books, uh, have been baked into our budget. Um, but these are incremental dollars compared to last year. Uh, this, uh, radio chemistry support is actually a grant that we received several years ago um, with the understanding that we received a grant at the provost's office would help support that. So he's put uh, those dollars in study next year. And then our Equine Institute, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And many of you have heard about our efforts there in our neuroscience or NCIN <coughs> program. Uh, the provost has been good enough to put in some additional dollars to support that. And the last bit from a financial perspective, um, second year in a row that we'll be seeing uh, raises throughout the university, so great news. Uh, as you know, um, for many years uh, that this didn't happen, so really excited that it's happening again. Uh, just from a financial perspective, uh, none of the dollars um, were, any, no money was taken off the top either at the provost level or the dean level. Uh, we did decide as an executive council that the departments would each take a small percent, 5% would be taken at the department level and then be able to use from an internal equity from a merit increase uh, within each department as was needed. And then these uh, raises will take effect in July. So last fall we talked about some college themes that are really critical for the success of all of us and how we really wanted to think about these um, as commonalities between all the different areas of the college and how we would better work together. So at that time we threw out four words. We didn't have a lot of description about what the definitions were or how we would implement that. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, we're not complete with this, but it is work that, that is ongoing. So uh, transparency, teamwork, and the next, uh, in the next slide we'll talk about uh, collaboration and accountability. And we started to put together a draft framework about when we say transparency, what does that mean to everybody in the college so that we're all speaking the same language? The other two things being collaboration and accountability. So let me give you some examples of how we're utilizing uh, these themes as far as in day-to-day -day practice. In the dean's office, we've developed what I would call core competencies for each individual role, including myself, our department heads, <laughs> and identified leadership traits that are important make sure that these happen. So myself at my six month review, we identified a survey that included core competencies on deans and many other leadership traits. And then um, my executive council, the other deans at CSU, the provost, and a couple other key individuals that I worked with a lot, did a six month evaluation on myself. How was I doing from leadership and from a, a core competency seats from the dean? We did the same thing in kind of beta testing with uh, Jack Nikoloff, who was going through a five year review as department head, and I would anticipate that we will continue to modify and, and work through that process, but it will be a great way for us to incorporate these as part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Additionally, we've been working on some very draft-oriented, the things that you need to be aware of uh, from a vision and mission perspective. So these are um, just four examples of things that the Executive Council with an ex external consulting company have started to put together to talk about who we are and what we do and catchy phrases that would allow us to better tell our story. So these are things that are not in stone as we put together our strategic plan and as we have a much bigger group of folks that are involved with our strategic plan and drafting our mission and vision. Um, we would look forward to any and all of your involvement in being able to finalize these and make sure they speak to everybody in the room and that they make sense uh, as far as our college and how we 
how we brand ourselves. So if you're interested in being involved with some of this work, uh, we'd love to have faculty and staff at all levels and in all departments um, being part of that effort. And then from the strategic planning perspective, we've interviewed several uh, external consultants that have come in and done a song and dance and said, hey, this is how we can help you put together a strategic plan. As you may know, our official one uh, on the books, I think, is a 2005 model. The truth is, if you look at the 2005 model, it looks very similar to the 2000 model, just with a little white out. And so uh, we're really going to look at um, doing something that you know takes us in uh, to the next five, ten years and really is something that allows us to build um, our new program um, and grow upon. At the same time, um, there are several units within the college that are moving forward with a strategic planning, which is great. Clinical science has been doing this for, for many months now and are close to finalizing their effort, which is wonderful. And then the D-Lab is just starting on their journey, so we want to give them license to continue their work um, while the college does, uh, does their effort at the same time. We'll spend just a couple moments talking about initiatives that you may have heard about, and then maybe some new things that um, have just come up that I want to make sure everybody is aware of. First one is our University of Alaska at Fairbanks 2 plus 2 veterinary program. And so my um, expectation is probably over the next month to two, you will start seeing um, press release, uh, memorandum of understanding uh, completed that announces our official collaboration with the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Uh, this is, as we've talked about it, both on this campus and up in Alaska, there's been more and more excitement about what a win-win uh, collaboration this will be, what a great opportunity will be for our faculty and students, and at the same time for the state of Alaska. So we've got uh, several um, faculty and administrators coming down from Fairbanks, I believe in May. Um, they'll spend some time here. And then they'll also then, um, spend some time at the Nebraska, Iowa universities um, where they have a two plus two program and see what uh, makes sense for us to incorporate from what they've done. <laughs> so many of you are familiar with the National Western Stock Show. Uh, been going on for many, many years in Denver. They're going through kind of a rebranding, renovation process, which will take them from a traditional stock show that happens every January to a program that is National Western Center. The National Western Center will be open all year, and it will really incorporate the culture of the West, agriculture, equine, um, ranching, all those things that they do now, but in a much more comprehensive educational way. They've um, worked with the city of Denver and with CSU to look at a significant urban revitalization project that would include the corridor from I-70, um, a light rail project which is going in there, um, the riverfront, which isn't a riverfront at the moment besides a river, um, and looking at an entire redevelopment of that part of the city, and they've asked CSU to be a major partner with that. So our college, the College of Agricultural Sciences, have been in negotiations or discussions with um, this group for a couple months now. We've asked Chris Kowchick to kind of lead up that effort, uh, mainly because our first glance at this is that this would be an opportunity for us to expand our equine sports and rehab um, and be able to have a footprint down in Denver. So uh, you'll see more and more discussion about that, but I didn't want anybody to be surprised. <clears throat> From a communications team perspective, a lot of interesting, great things moving forward. We've embedded two full-time communication specialists within the development team. Obviously, uh, for our development team to do all the things that they're going to be doing in the years ahead, they need to have a very strong communication component with our alumni, with our collateral, with our other efforts there, um, with our hiring Coleman, and with some uh, significant collaboration with Central. We're really looking at doing a significant marketing campaign. We're hiring a medical marketing group to look at how we can market ourselves as far as a veterinary teaching hospital and a college in a more significant Way. So my guess is you'll start seeing our college highlighted at a DIA, you'll start seeing um, other marketing things, whether that be in the press, whether that be things on billboards, um, that talk about all the great things that we do in the college. As a personal note, we try to be nuts to open up a newspaper and see another <coughs> veterinary clinic here in town talking about themselves in the CSU newspaper have a billboard across the street that they're teaching us for it's not. So <laughs> we're going to fix that. Uh, many of you know that within the veterinary um, college, within ABMA, within uh, the veterinary community, that One Health has become a huge topic of discussion. And it's been amazing to me that CSU, who should be a world leader 
in one health um, and has many of the assets and all the, the faculty and the components to be that leader haven't um, been recognized in that, um, in that arena. So we've uh, created a task force or a working group to look at how we can position ourselves to do more in this, in this place. Uh, I just met with uh, the um, VP for International Relations, uh, Jim Cooney, yesterday in the VPR office. And um, we are looking at the Fall International Colloquium, which happens every year um, here at CSU to be a One Health Colloquium. And then we're also hosting, along with USDA and some other key partners, uh, an International Wildlife for Disease Workshop here this fall. So uh, both those things uh, will fall underneath some of the work we're doing with the One Health Initiative. And then I would anticipate that this working group, including multiple colleges on campus, including the USDA, CDC, National Wildlife Research Center, We'll start to pull together some um, positioning statements about what CSU is doing and how we'd like to be part of the growth that we're going to see here at CSU in the years ahead. So many of you have heard about and have been part of uh, this Equine Institute, if you will, which pulls together a lot of the great things that we do already at CSU in regards to um, our equine work and um, builds it underneath a, a signal umbrella with what you see there. So, um, uh, multiple entities came together, a day-long retreat to look at this Equine Institute, came up with this great uh, tagline, uh, integrating health, science, and education for the benefit of horses and humans. So um, you will start to see a website, you will start to see other collateral, you will start to see more and more effort behind an Equine Institute at CSU that is a little bit less about the individual entities and more about uh, that group as a whole. I'll tell you that um, this will allow us to really build out some of the growth that we're expecting in the years ahead. New equine hospital, some of the other uh, collaborations with our partners over at the College of Ag Sciences regarding uh, a writing center and an education center. So uh, great stuff, I will say, um, which is part of the Equine Institute. You guys all need to be aware of it. If you can attend, we'd love to have you there. But the ERL is opening this Friday be a phenomenal event. We're expecting well over 200 people. It includes our president, our chancellor, it includes a variety of government officials, it includes all of our uh, faculty, hopefully, that work in the equine space here. Um, and if you haven't been over to the new ER building, it is a phenomenal facility, um, both to teach, provide service. It's just going to be a great place for those to work. And um, we hope if you can't come on Friday that you'll come out and see it, because it's, it's wonderful. <coughs> So I would be remiss to you know, talk about all the wonderful things that are out there without talking about you know, some of the challenges that are facing us. We've been working from a veterinary education perspective uh, to try to determine how big of a crisis it is or not with the students giving out of our programs, how much do they owe from the student debt perspective, how easily are they able to find jobs, how much are they able to be um, compensated when they do find these jobs. I think all of this was in the works anyway when suddenly a big New York Times article came out several months ago that highlighted a raw student who just graduated. She owed well over $300,000 um, in student debt. She was having a hard time uh, uh, acquiring a job, and when she did, the amount of money she was making, it was obvious that she could never pay off her debt in her lifetime. So, um, so that grabbed quite a bit of attention in the public eye, and certainly within the veterinary community. It highlighted that while we were doing things, we probably need to really make sure that we're doing lots of things in the we're doing them right. So I wanted to share some of the things that we're doing at CSU. First of all, I'm very involved on a national level with the AVMA, with the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. We're looking at what's the real data from students graduating, how much are they making, are they able to find jobs, and what are the areas where we have too many vets, and I use that in quotations, versus um, where we might need to be able to recruit, make sure students are going into non-traditional areas. So there's a lot of work going into that. I think ABMA will tell you that we need to follow a bit of the, the world of dentistry in the sense that we know that pet ownership is higher than it has ever been across the country. And at the same time, we know that people bringing their pets into veterinarians has been on the downslide for several years. So what's the real answer to that? Well, a big part of that is making sure that we know wellness, preventative medicine, will help our pets live longer. We know that we keep our teeth longer now because we go in for a routine prophylaxis on our teeth. The same model can be and should be provided to dogs and cats, but we haven't really talked about that in profession how to do that in a functional way. Loan calculator, I'm you know, personally always 
very sad when I hear about a veterinary student who has spent all the time getting into veterinary school, comes and joins us for six months, a year, two years, and then realizes that although they signed on the dot of lies that it was going to cost them twenty, fifty, two hundred thousand dollars to go through the program, they suddenly realize they can't pay for it. And so now as part of the application process, when they apply to veterinary school, they will go through a required loan calculator that shows them how much do they currently owe as they get out of their undergraduate program, how much it will cost them as a resident or non-resident to go to school, how much they will have to pay every month once they get out. And I would much prefer to have less number of students applying um, and deciding that they don't want to do this going in than getting into vet school and deciding that this isn't, isn't for them. We're also looking at uh, enhanced financial education in our curriculum. Right now we do a decent job when they start during orientation. Um, they get some more financial uh, planning and education during the last couple of years. But we need to embed this into all four years um, so that they are fully educated on what uh, they're taking on from the debt load and how to spend money. Uh, as you know, we talked a little bit about during our fall forum, a new scholarship that um, was just being awarded or just starting to come to our knowledge, a million dollars, uh, brand new dollars that um, we were able to get for scholarships. So each year for the next 10, 11 years, we'll be adding an additional $100,000 on top of our uh, current scholarship program to veterinary students to help <coughs> offset uh, some of that through the bond scholarships. Uh, a group of students have put together a student survey um, that looks not only at the financial impact and how are they feeling about that, but they've also asked a variety of questions about our curriculum and we're just starting to look at the data associated with that, but there's some great information that we'll be getting back to you about that. And then lastly, uh, Dean Hendrickson and myself will start a series of town halls, which are just open, open forums for the students to come and chat with us about whatever's on their mind. Uh, we'll start with our first one tomorrow. We're planning to have several of these every semester. Just a quick look at some of the new collaborations since we uh, were able to get together last fall. Uh, these both show an international component in Africa and Asia and then right here in Central um, in, in Colorado with some of the new collaborations that we've been able to um, sign and make sure that our programs are growing. A quick call out and thank you for all of the research folks in the room and when I say that everybody does some degree of, but for those that live and die on NIH or government research, we know how difficult it has been for you. We know that in the good old days, you know, 20%, 12, 15% of, of proposals were funded. Now we're in the single digits, and it's amazing to have quality programs that are doing all the work that they're doing um, and not being able to move forward. So I know that that's terribly difficult. Sequestration certainly hasn't helped any of that at all. And so I wanted to recognize and thank um, the top number here is a great example. This is the highest number of proposals that our college has ever submitted. Um, and that's because you guys are working harder to uh, get the dollars that are available. And even in these difficult times, you can see that in uh, last year, the uh, award dollars received were still going up. Um, and even looking at this year, we're either going to be very similar to last year or maybe even up a little bit as far as grants received. So a great testament to who you are and what we do, um, knowing how difficult these times are from a government and uh, a research funding perspective. Quick look at facility planning. Um, so we got some great news recently, a couple months ago, that UFAB um, student uh, group that awards facility dollars gave us a million dollars uh, to enhance our anatomy um, facilities. And so those will be a significant enhancement for both the human anatomy, cadaver laboratory, and also for the, for the veterinary anatomy. And we'll be able to split those two what currently live in the same place into two different, two different areas. Also, the huge amount of work that's going in over at the Teaching Hospital, thank you to Tim Packett and all of those folks that are taking a 1979 structure and going to basically remodel the entire thing so that it's a state-of-the-art facility to meet our uh, future needs. So the critical care unit is now walled up um, with a bunch of uh, boards, but we anticipate that to be open in the summer and to really be a fantastic new facility. And then we will just march our way through the Veterinary Teaching Hospital um, and be able to remodel the Thing. And then lastly, I've been involved with a lot of uh, discussions with Central about CSU 2020. I'm sure most of you have heard some of these discussions. My guess is that after the Board of Governors meets in May, when Tony presents his next version of CSU 2020, we'll get some more clarity 
about what this is and what it means to us. But I just want you to know that um, on a university level, there's a lot of discussion about taking a campus to this 27,000, building it up to 35,000, and what does that mean for new programs? What does that mean for new buildings? What does that mean for new faculty and growth? Um, all those things. Um, we're working hard as a college to make sure that we can maximize uh, our growth in a strategic way in conjunction with what CSU is doing. So if there's a new science building, let's make sure that it's going to do all the things that we need it to do. If we're going to grow our programs, we probably aren't growing our veterinary programs, but we have significant abilities to grow undergraduate and some of our uh, master's programs as well. So a big thanks. I know there's a lot of folks in the room from our development team. They've been doing some phenomenal work. Uh, here's some major gifts that have just uh, come in over the last many months, um, and this is really helping us with you know, less research dollars coming in, how do we grow our facilities, our programs, it's through efforts like this, and so many thanks for making that happen. 22 promotion and tenure packages came my way. First time in 52 years I've ever seen those. <laughs> And it was a great experience for me, and I'll tell you, um, it really helped seed in me the huge amount of work that all of you do. When I read through letters of support from outside uh, individuals, when I read through all of the publications and the research grants and all the different departments, when I go to the Council of Deans and see other major colleges you know, that are putting forth you know, six letters, uh, six packages for promotion and tenure, it makes me really appreciate and understand the magnitude of the work that all of you do. So, uh, my only caveat here is that uh, our president is taking all of these packages with his recommendation to move forward to the Board of Governors. So this isn't official, official, official till after the main meeting, but I've been told by um, our provost and president that all of these names are being supported in the promotion and tenure as we move forward. So we're moving to our kind of uh, honoring some of our retirees and congratulating some of our award winners. Um, I don't believe Bob is here today, so I'll ask Barry to come up and join us. You know, we don't have a gold watch, but we do have a clock for you. Does that mean? <laughs> Thank you very much. I know. years and I wish that I had a chance to work with you more but congratulations for all the work you've done. Well it's been a great 30 plus years. Can I have Sundays off? You can have Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> so Sherry is not retiring, let me be very clear, but she is not going to be our assistant dean of admissions after 25 years of doing this and done a fantastic job. I don't know why she wanted to do a little something different. Um, but she's going to be heading up a lot of our efforts when we think about um, distance learning programs, when we think about how we're going to use some of these new modalities to teach our students in the future. Returning to the faculty, thank you very much for all the You don't get the real thing. So these are surprises. Nobody knew about this, well maybe a couple people knew about this. So these are uh, Department of Awards for Outstanding Employee Service. If I could ask these folks to come up, I know that Kathy's here, Carol's here, and I don't know if Billy's here or not. But why don't we have you guys come up and I'd love to award you.
eyes, but I'm going to uh, stand close to Dr. Ken Blem, who is going to speak into one of these microphones and help me with our next awards, which are for the Student Choice Awards. And congratulations to all of the folks that are up there. Is Bill out there? No, we're going to go the other. Yep. I've got a different order here. So, uh, do you think you're the dean or something? <laughs> Some of you may know that uh, each year, for almost the past 10 years, we poll our students repeatedly during the months of January and February, and we call these the Student Choice Awards. The awards that I'm going to announce now across our graduate curriculum, our PBM curriculum, and our undergraduate curriculum are driven solely by students. Nominations and then subsequent votes to those winners. So our categories that we have to award are one, unique to the professional veterinary medicine curriculum, that is in the area of practice management. We then have three awards in innovative instruction, one in PBM, one in graduate education, one in undergraduate education, and then we have three awards in advising, again, PBM, graduate, and undergraduate education. So with that, I'd like to start off by announcing the first award in Grand Event in the area of exceptional practice management, Felix Durer. Felix? In the area of graduate education, may I ask Marie Laguerre to step forward, please. Someday, and innovative instruction in that area is awarded to David Gilkey. And 
last but not least, somebody who's probably particularly capable of herding cats, which sometimes our undergraduate population feels a lot like. In our largest department, a noteworthy advising achievement goes to Kelly Swedish. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well done. So, we will take a couple questions, but I do not want to stand in front of you in a cold beverage. So, um, we'll just take a couple questions, and then I will be glad to stand up here for a while. Afterwards, when the troops have been released up to food and beverage, um, and answer any questions you might have on an individual basis. I will ask, there are some questionnaires on your, on your chair. This is the second. Um, forum that I've been able to participate. I'd love to hear if you like them, if you don't like them, what do you want to see more of, what do you want to see less of, as we kind of uh, perfect these over time. So that being said, I saw a question go up already. Sir. The question was regarding the National Western Talk Show. Um, as it has evolved the discussions over the last couple of years, there were times that there was talk about moving the National Western Stock Show out of Denver. There was talk about moving it out of its current facilities and over by the airport. There was talk about it collaborating with other big convention spaces. I think what the leadership of the National Western Stock Show has done after a long list of potential options is said, we're here to stay in Denver, we're here to stay at our current facilities, and we're working with the city of Denver as our urban redevelopment project knowing that I-70 is uh, being remodeled anyway, knowing that they're putting in a light rail, already have dollars from the federal government to put in a light rail between them and the convention center, and that they want to develop a, a riverfront convention spot, and they want to include the city as far as some of the public schools and some of the urban changes in a, in a significant way. So we believe that they are working with the city to get something on the ballot either this year or next year that would allow them to raise bond dollars to make this happen. And whether it happens or not, I don't know, but I think we want to be there if it does um, to help with what we want to do. Nobody wants to ask a question. Yeah. Well, Allison, there's no questions. Come on, we've got time for a couple. We won't close the bar right away. <laughs> John, what do you got for me today? Is the state going to give us any more money next year? So the question is, is the state going to give us any more money next year? Um, us being CSU are getting some additional dollars. Us being our college, not that I'm aware of. And so um, I believe last there were times that the state gave us no money. Last year we had about $2 million that CSU got for deferred maintenance um, to help with aging facilities and buildings. Um, I'm told that the number thrown out there for next year is more in the six million dollar range that will go to CSU to help us with facility infrastructure. Um, so zero to two million to six million is a nice trajectory. Um, what that means to our college, I can't answer that. And I don't even know if that's stamped yet. I, I do think, as you know, as the economy rebounds and as the state of Colorado rebounds, we are hearing more and more um, that they understand the value of CSU and they understand that they need to put money back into one of their strongest assets. So the last building that the state funded was our state diagnostic lab out of the South Campus. <laughs> Myself, Dean Beirudi, Dean McCubbin went down and testified, chatted to the Joint uh, Commission on Agriculture just about a month ago, and we heard loud and clear from them that they know what we're doing and they want to help us and that as soon as there are capital assets in the state budget, they hope to be able to divert some of them our way. As much of a promise as I can. <coughs> Hi there. So 
So Suzette was asking you about uh, facility changes in the anatomy, physiology, biology world, if I heard your question right. In the short term, you're going to continue to see small changes. And when I say that, you know, as we look at remodeling physiology, anatomy, as we look at hiring new faculty and then needing new lab space and we're going to invest in that, that is ongoing. And any specific ones, I check with um, Bob here and see what are the short term plans and making sure that your needs are being met by those. Bigger things, you know, I think one of the next buildings that the university is committed to do to, to build is this biology building. Um, and I think that will help our college significantly. Building a biology building allows us to expand into that current uh, zoology space. Um, I've asked and have not um, been told when they say the next building, if the next building means next summer or in 10 years. I just don't know that. <laughs> I will stay up here. Um, please know that uh, just out in the lobby, um, I'm hoping everybody can stay for a while and enjoy each other's company, some food and beverage, and I really appreciate all you guys coming today. Thanks very much.